Uh, good morning. I'm Mike Zafarovsky, and Mason and the rest of this group here this morning would like to welcome you to the Church of the Holy Spirit. This is a special session, uh, number 100, uh, since Bob Murley and I started this Faith at Work ministry back in 2009. Uh, we have an uh, in-person audience here this morning. Uh, they do have masks, and we are following the CDC guidelines. And I'm sure the fact that uh, Mason Plumley and NBA stories with us here t today, I'm sure we have a pretty large audience of Zoom and live streaming. Uh, I will introduce uh, Mason in a minute, but before that, as we normally do, start with the morning prayer. Uh, Father Luke. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mason, for being here. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the presence of Mason Plumley here with us today and pray for his continued success on the court and his continued thriving in the spirit of our Lord off the court. We also acknowledge and give great thanksgiving for the 100th faith at work, for the many ways that the conversations, the testimonials, the witnesses that have been shared in this context have blessed many, many lives, blessed many, many workplaces. And on this Labor Day weekend, we offer you this prayer. You, O oh God, have so linked our lives one with another that all we do affects for good or ill, all other lives. So guide us in the work we do, that we may do it not for self alone, but for the common good. And as we seek a proper return for our own labor, make us mindful of the rightful aspirations of other workers and arouse our concern for those who are without work. We ask all this in the name of our Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, and the Prince of Peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Luke. Uh, before I introduce uh, Mason, just as a quick background, again, it's uh, Mason, like the previous 99 speakers, we've, we've been involved in a discussion on uh, three major items. One, your life story, your background, if you will. Mm -hmm. Second, your faith journey in any epiphanies. The very important, uh, how do the individuals, do they, and if yes, how do they bring faith to their workplace, whatever their workplace may be. The previous 99 speakers have come from all walks of life, all gender, um, all the three major religions. No fit executives, uh, not-for-profit leaders, teachers, principals, homemakers, uh, but each story is very unique and special. And I would argue today's speaker is as unique as they come, not only because he's almost seven foot tall. Uh, hopefully you've seen his bio and his personal website. I mean, I was very impressed with your website, the roots section, but also all the interviews you've done with founders of businesses. I mean, just pretty amazing. Uh, again, hopefully you've seen his bio, but uh, I'll cover it quickly. Uh, Mason will be the starting center forward for the Charlotte Hornets uh, of the National Basketball Association. Off the court, uh, Mason is a highly respected and very savvy investor and entrepreneur, including a co-founder of a Free Solo Ventures. It's an early stage uh, healthcare uh, uh, venture fund who invested in innovative startups um, uh, in, in healthcare, uh, looking at potential for global scale expansion but also to impact the industry shift from, toward value-based uh, care. A native of Warsaw, Indiana, not Poland, he played alongside his brothers Marshall and Miles at Duke University. They also have a sister, Maddie, who went to Notre Dame. During his four years at uh, Duke, he helped lead the Blue Devils to the NCAA championship in 2010. I'm proudly wearing a Duke um, polo shirt. Uh, and twice earned uh, first team all academic honors. A former first round draft pick, 
A gold medalist for the U.S. Uh, men's national team, an NBA all-rookie first team. Uh, Mason is widely recognized as one of the best uh, top playmaking forwards in the world. Mason is involved in a number of philanthropies and is a person of deep faith. Uh, our family has had the privilege of knowing Mason since he was freshman at Duke. Our son Todd and Mason um, roomed uh, for a couple years together. And I can attest personally, he is, one of the, he is one of the nicest human beings in the world. And also I would add, one of the hardest working human beings in the world too. So Mason, welcome. Uh, Mason, as we discussed, maybe we'll probably go for about 35 or 40 minutes. Cool. Then we'll have a Q&A from the audience and people will be texting me some of the questions to ask you as well. Uh, but first one, your early life. I mean, life in the Warsaw, Indiana, your siblings, your parents, um, your early motivations in life and any competitions uh, with your brothers. For sure. For, first of all, thanks for inviting me on and having me on. Great to, to see you again. Um, Early life, you know, I, I grew up in, like you said, Warsaw, Indiana. Um, one of, I, I had three siblings, an older brother, younger brother, little sister. Um, you know, we, we uh, started out in West Lafayette, Indiana, moved to Warsaw and spent most of our time in Warsaw. Um, you know, a small town, but, but a fun town. Um, we, we had a, a, a good time there. And then uh, me and my brothers actually went away for high school. We went to an Episcopal school in Asheville, North Carolina an all boys boarding school. And um, that was, to me, um, that was kind of the, the, the start of the faith journey that I, I know we'll get into. But um, you know, when you're, when you're in your parents' home, you, you go to church because that's, <laughs> that's what they're telling that's you to you do. do yeah. <laughs> and then um, you know, it, it becomes a little different when, when you leave the home. But now what kind of church is it? Your mom was Catholic? Yeah, my mom Catholic and then my dad um, Presbyterian, but we, you know, in our hometown we went to a non-denominational church. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, Pastor Denny Wilson at WCC um, has been great um, for our family and for myself. Um, so, so certainly appreciate you know, his, his wisdom over the years and his delivery of the message. Um, and it's, um, you know, it, it was a great, a great community to grow up in from that side of things. And how about your brothers? I mean, did you yeah. guys compete very much? Or yeah, we fought all the time. We, <laughs> <laughs> we said, you know, what, what were our interests early on? Basketball and fighting over basketball. And <laughs> we would play a lot in the driveway. Um, you know, we, it's, it's funny because like our parents, they were probably sick of us fighting all the time, but then when, when we left the home, we act, we became like really close friends, but I don't know if that would have happened um, under them. So <laughs> they didn't get to enjoy us getting along, but um, eventually it, it happens, which I'm sure happens with a lot of siblings. Um, but yeah, you know, like I said, in, in Indiana, basketball is like the game of choice. Everybody wants to play it. That was all of our early interests, um, but, but like any, kids we tried everything we we tried swimming baseball soccer found out what we weren't good at you know tried instruments um, <laughs> a, a lot of which, things which, which one did you try piano piano, piano was yeah my, miles tried the uh the trumpet for a little bit but yeah they're just trying to keep us busy because you know there's not a whole lot to do in in indiana yeah my mom tried god bless so many years ago to try the piano and the music teacher said well have your boy do sports or other things to decide yeah, yeah. <laughs> in music. Uh, what was the early motivations and when you think about what you wanted to do with your career, yeah. was it always sports or did you have some other aspirations at that time? Yeah, um, you know, as a kid, I, I had no problem dreaming about things. So I just thought I could play basketball forever. Um, and, and I was fortunate to be able to, to do that at least up until now. And now, now it's, um, you know, realizing there, there's an end and a, a finite time to that career. Um, and that's what's got me into some of the off the court stuff. But um, yeah, early on, I mean, it was just, you couldn't convince me I was gonna do anything other than, than play mm -hmm. basketball, so. Tell me that with the decision we move on to Duke, uh, Duke Coach K and obviously the camera on crazes. But what was the recruitment process like? Yeah. And how um, did you decide on Duke first of all? Yeah, it's 
Um, it's a good question because it, it really felt like the first, you know, big decision I mm -hmm. had to make um, in my life. You know, me, me going to boarding school was more um, my parents um, doing. And then, you know, I, I get to choose. There are a lot of, a lot of great universities. Um, I was fortunate to have a couple um, scholarship offers. So uh, Coach K was great. You know, he flew in um, to Asheville, met me at, at the high school, um, you know, and, invited me to come and play for Duke. And it's just hard to say no to coach, <laughs> as you, you know coach well. Yeah. Um, he's, he's very convincing and he's just, I think what makes him a great recruiter is he's so authentic and genuine. Um, you know, he, he believes what he's saying and, and he had a vision for myself um, that really connected with, you know, where I wanted my career to go. And, um, but again, like, you know, with, with those big decisions and I've always referenced that decision, I, it's always just been good to, to pray about it and, and feel a peace about it before making those decisions. And um, that's what I had in, in committing to him and the university. When he came to watch you play, did you take any three-point shots? I did. I, I, <laughs> I, I played a little different in high school than I did in college. But um, no, he, he was great. He, um, he came to a couple AAU games, came to a couple high school games. But um, you know, you learn on the backside that the college coaches appreciate it when you commit fast and you don't make them come to a lot of high school games. So. <laughs> um, no, he was great, though. And, and I'm super happy. Obviously, I've gotten to know you guys. You know, t got to live with Todd for four years, um, one of my closest friends. So it was a, a great college experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, tell me about transition, being presumably the best player by far on a high school team. And what was it like to become, obviously, still a top high caliber player but not necessarily the go-to player for yeah. scoring how did that transition go it, it doesn't seem like a big transition but it's it's tougher than you think because to your point you know up in you know elementary middle high school you're more more if you're at the college level you've been the best player every step of the way and really in college I wasn't the best player until my senior year you know and even then we still had Seth Curry who you know um, mm -hmm. so it you know it's it kind of uh, it forces you to um, to find a way to make yourself valuable with within the team, um, without just being the the go-to guy taking all the shots, playing as free as you want because you know you're going to play all the minutes you want. So all of a sudden it, it kind of resets you, and you know you say, okay, well, you know I, I have to I have to earn earn my minutes, earn my opportunities, and uh, you know figure out a way to help the team win, and, and hope that that lands me on the floor. Was the same transition from college to the NBA, I'm assuming the... Yeah, and it was even, I mean, the NBA is even, uh, even harder just because, uh, you know, you, I came in on a team where everybody was 30 or older. They had all, you know, five to 15 years in the league, um, and they're very established. Mm -hmm. And when you come in, even if you're, I wasn't a high pick, but even if you're a high pick, you, you come in and you have to earn it from day one. So... You know, I, I've loved those those transitional years. Um, my rookie year I'll, is one of my um, one of my favorite years. I, I don't think any any professional athlete forgets their rookie year just because um, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. But it, there were a lot of challenges that came with it, and um, you know, I'm sure stuff we'll speak on. But you know, I had a great group of veterans that um, that helped me along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, before moving on to your faith journey, me two questions. And the one on Coach K. Describe his coaching style. Yeah. Any advice, the best coaching advice he gave you, and yeah. do you still stay in touch with him now? Yeah, I, I do stay in touch with him. I was just down um, in Durham three weeks ago to see him. Um, he's doing really well. He's excited for his last season. Um, his coaching style, I would say he's, you know, X and O wise, there's nothing he, he doesn't know or isn't prepared <laughs> for. His, his preparation is unlike anybody's I've seen in any profession. Um, but what I think people don't realize is, is how much of a motivator he is. Um, I think he's really into the psychology of, of coaching and of sport and, and getting the most out of his, his teams, but also individuals. So, you know, he, um, he gets pulled a lot of different directions. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants his time, but he, he'll always make time for his players, and, and that's his priority. And um, I think that's why, you know, I, I spent four years there, um, and, and I learned – and, and appreciated, uh, you know, each year that I was there. Is he pretty consistent, if you will, or does he tailor his coaching style and mentoring and um, 
all the other things that go with being a leader and a coach to, to the individual players. Yeah, he, he definitely tailors it. I, I would say he's, he's consistent in his caring for, right? Like, he, he's never going to come in and, like, oh, today's not the day. Like, he's, he's always on, so to speak, but he will certainly tailor his, um, his messaging and his delivery of, of the message to each individual. If he thinks it's better to call you out in front of the team, he'll, he'll try that. If that doesn't work, he'll talk to you one-on-one -on -one in his office. He'll, he'll try anything to, to get um, the most out of his guys. Any favorite Coach K stories? Oh man, there's there's so many. <laughs> um, you know, I just to me the the one I appreciated is like when if guys weren't willing to dive on the floor, here Coach, you know, he he's in great shape, but he had, he does have you know an artificial hip, artificial knee. He'll huh? show you how to dive on the floor for a ball. <laughs> <laughs> You're kind of like, all right, I'll I'll do it if you don't do it, and you don't have to show me ever again because we want to make sure you can get back up. Mm -hmm. Does he still do it when you he talk was to doing it with, players? Yeah, he, he did he, it when you were there? Yeah, he did it when I was there. I haven't talked to the guys. Yeah. But. And the Cameron Crazes, I mean, maybe you can describe if someone is not familiar with the Cameron Crazes, maybe you can yeah. describe who Cameron, they are yeah. and maybe some of your most um, fond memories of, uh, yeah. of their antics. Yeah, our, our fan base at Duke is, is amazing. Um, they're the most... Uh, passionate fans but also the the most intelligent and they would do they would do a lot of research before the games and and uh they'd have material for every player on the other team so <laughs> uh they they had some great chance some great uh signage over the years and, and things to to try to get the other team distracted i mean here sometimes they're even supposed to be even so quote unquote sophisticated or clever that the player that's supposed to be getting picked on does not even fully appreciate what yeah. the joke is supposed to be. For sure. So someone sure. gets into their heads and they try to figure out. Yeah, no, they're, they're great. They, and they, they would go at the coaches of the other team, the players. And everybody was fair game for the camera crazies. And then also to, to the passion point, they would, as you know, every year it alternates whether you finish the season at Chapel Hill or in Durham. Yep. If, if the last game was in Durham, they would camp out sometimes for a couple months in advance mm -hmm. just to be at the Carolina game. And they had like, in Krzyzewskiville, they had rules and you had to have somebody sleeping in the tent every night or you <laughs> lose your place in line. And it's, you know, it's, it's not Florida in North Carolina. It gets cold yeah. and there's snow and like, they're out there um, holding their spot for the game. So it was a great fan base and really fun to play in front of. Well, let's move on to the main topic. Uh, spent um, quite a bit of time on faith before moving on to your other activities, but uh, maybe describe your faith um, from the early times in Warsaw mm -hmm. and how it evolved over the years. Yeah, um, well, I'll pick back up from, you know, when I mentioned going to high school. Um, went, went to high school and, and that really gave me a, a better rhythm with um, you know, a faith-based community. We had a uh, chapel, you know, a couple times a week and then service every Sunday that, that was mandatory. Um, but, um, you know, it was, it was good to get in the rhythm of, of going, mm -hmm. right? And, and I had that from my parents and, and being at home. And then I would say college is, is really the first time and, and I, you know, I didn't go as much my freshman and sophomore year, um, and, nor did I spend a whole a whole lot of time myself in the word or, or um, kind of re refreshing or, or learning. Um, and then I would say really my, my junior and senior years of college, you know, I made a decision to, uh, to find myself um, in a setting where I could continue to learn, practice faith and, um, and work with others. So to me, um, you know, I, I needed that from college and then I really had the same experience as a professional. You know, the first, my first couple years in the league, um, there's so much going on, the schedule's crazy, and, and to, to be able to find that time. Um, and really to me, like what, what became important instead of like finding the time is it, it became the priority and, and realizing, um, you know, I, I need this, I need the word, I need the direction, I need the forgiveness and, and uh, being excited to seek that out rather than checking a box, so to speak. So, um, you know, I feel like every, Everywhere I've gone, um, it, it's taken me a little bit to, to kind of um, reorient, so mm -hmm. to speak, but um, it, it's become 
important to me everywhere I've gone. I mean, most college students take quote unquote sabbatical from church and their faith journey during those three, four, five college years. Um, was there any pressure on you, if you will, or I mean, ridicule, if you will, mm-hmm. if you're pursuing the faith journey? Was it uh, was were the people pretty respectful? Uh, I would say people people in that area of the country were respectful. Mm-hmm. Um, you had a good group. You um, fellow students as well. Yeah, fellow students. I I think it's because um, most of it's off campus. I think mm-hmm. people don't necessarily realize like who's. Um, you know, I, I went to the Summit Church. Uh, J.D. Greer leads it down in, in Raleigh. Um, it was great, and they had, um, you know, they had satellite locations around mm-hmm. the different universities because you have NC State, Chapel Hill, right. Dur- Duke, all right there. So um, it was good, but it, you know, it, it helped me connect because sometimes, to your point, like within the university, you, you don't feel like there's there's a lot of other people pursuing that, mm-hmm. and um, once you do find out where they're going, it. It can be uplifting and, and encouraging that, that there are others mm-hmm. to connect with. Now, you and I have discussed and I've watched some of your other podcasts, if you will, in this topic, but describe when you say the most important thing is your life and when you play mm-hmm. is to play for an audience of one. Yeah. Yeah. That, I really, that was shared with me by um, Mo Machalski, who runs Athletes in Action, mm-hmm. um, super guy, and, and he used to travel with uh, USA Basketball and, and uh, you know, work with us. But there, there's so much um, criticism and praise, um, both undue at times with our profession. And uh, I put way too much into, you know, people's opinion, whether it be legitimate uh, media members or just people on social mm-hmm. media, Twitter, otherwise. And um, I got to a point where it, you know, it just wasn't as enjoyable to go out and, and you heard, um, you could you could hear in your own head the, the criticisms or like I said, the praise sometimes is, it's not necessarily warranted. So, you know, to me, um, you know, I really fell on, you know, do your work heartily as if unto the Lord and, and allow him to be that audience and, you know, win, lose, uh, you know, big moments where you, you came through or big moments where you came up short. You know, I was involved in a play in the playoffs where, you know, I just got killed in the media for not, um, or rather for switching a screen, not not switching a screen, but um, those things, it's like, and it, it kind of uh, resets you and, and helps you realize like, um, you know, him being your audience is more important mm-hmm. than, than ESPN or mm-hmm. than... <laughs> You also had said is that you developed a personal relationship with Jesus. I mean, mm-hmm. if somebody is a, you know, if it's a, somebody that may not be faith-oriented uh, or knowledgeable, mm-hmm. how would you describe when you say you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Yeah, I just, I feel, you know, open line of communication to, to pray at any point. Um, you know, I, I believe in that, and um, you know, I ask for wisdom, ask for forgiveness, ask for uh, patience. Um, you know, I, I've just come to realize I need that, and I need it daily. So, um, to me, that personal relationship is um, just being able to to go to God with my needs, and, and I, I believe in that wholeheartedly. Mm-hmm. And maybe you can <clears throat> share with us some of your sp- spiritual routines. I mean, yeah. do you pray or daily prayers? Do, yeah. you, do you go to men's or, or Bible studies? Uh, who are your favorite pastors or authors? And, and maybe some of the... Yeah, for sure. Um, it, one of the challenges with the league and, and any pro sports, um, the, the schedule is crazy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you may be in yeah. four or five cities in a week. Um, you know, it's hard, it's hard to, to find a setting like this where you can come every mm-hmm. Sunday and, and connect with a congregation. But um, what we do have within the league is a lot of people don't know, 60 minutes before tip-off, we have a 15-minute um, period where uh, the host team has a chaplain that comes in and speaks. So um, that's really been great for me um, in my time in the league. And it, it's very short, but you get to connect with other people. It, and the other team comes in, other teams' coaches. Um, and, and there's 
there's good people to connect with. And then I've grown close with the pastors in those respective markets that I've played in. Um, but as far as, you know, authors, um, you know, one of my favorites is Francis Chan. Um, we were sp speaking this morning about Timothy Keller and some of his sermons and how impactful they are. Um, you know, I, I've just been uh, so, uh, you know, impressed with the, the people that I've, I've been fortunate enough to meet while traveling throughout the country. Um, you know, Brian Barley, who's a, a pastor in Denver, um, I, I learned a ton from when I was out there, and he was big on, you know, how important the church is to the city, which I know Tim, Tim Keller is mm -hmm. as well, but um, I really connected with him on that because, you know, the NBA is cities. We're in, you know, these 25 cities all year, and um, you want to make your, uh, you want to have an impact on, I've now been in five of them, but the cities that you're in while you're there. So um, those are some of the people that, that I'd, I'd point to to just say thank you to you guys um, because in my journey they've been instrumental. Awesome, awesome, and uh, Tim Keller, you mentioned. Um, uh, do you have a favorite book from his, or yeah. or is it a favorite sermon? Yeah, I, my favorite sermon of his is. Uh, in, there are a couple different. Um, he speaks on it a lot, but just you know, I, identity, identity, in, in, in our culture today. Um, how identity has developed over time. Um, th that, that was so impactful to me, um, kind of this idea of, you know, it's, it's not so important what, what you think about me. It's not even so important what I think about me, but rather what, what God thinks about me. And, um, you know, that's, that was powerful to me. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've watched it, but um, like we were talking about at breakfast, like he just, <laughs> everything he says just seems so, so, so right and so wise. And, uh, it's easy to, to soak it in, so. Um, yeah, the thing that really resonates is we spoke this morning, if you pursue whatever it is, power, wealth, um, physical appearance, you always be disappointed there's never enough. I guess whatever you're looking for versus, a, versus a, again, as you said, yeah. versus a, the audience of one. Um, do you have a favorite? Uh, uh, part of the scripture, do you have a favorite? favorite um... Yeah, um, you know, just given how much I've moved uh, starting in high school, um, you know, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Um, you, know, you get traded a couple times. You, <laughs> you start, you start, uh, you start looking to God and, and just believing that each, each of your steps is directed by him. So it, you know, it, it kind of takes, um, the weight off my mind of saying, you know, what, what could I have done differently? You know, what, what happened in this city or with this coach or whatever. And you just, you just become thankful for, for the next mm -hmm. step and, and you don't look back. Good. And how open are, are you about your faith? Yeah. That, Friends, yeah. media, I mean, whatever the case may be. Or... Uh, I'm certainly open about it. Um, you know, I, I have, uh, I've made an effort to, to try to, acted out more so than um you know engage people um in, but but i want to live in such a way that it it uh it does engage people to ask mm -hmm. and 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 then be in a position to share one one of my favorite teammates um when i was in portland i played with the guy chris Kamen, who was um yeah. very devout um super super teammate super family man and um i found myself asking him questions about about dating, about finances, about all these things. And, and I realized it was just, you know, he, he never approached me or anything, but by how he acted, it, um, it warranted me, my interest in, in engagement of him. So awesome. um, that was impactful to me. Okay. Big switch now to your business, entrepreneurial yeah. slash investment career. What did you first become interested in business? How yeah. did it come about? Um, I feel like I was always interested growing up. Um, we had a couple people in my hometown that were founders of companies um, and to see you know, what they did not only for their employees but for the whole town. Um, there was a, a guy named Dane Miller who founded Biomet mm -hmm. and um, you know, developed our, our downtown Win Winona Lake. And I was just like, wow, this, this is amazing. Like you, can, <laughs> you can not only help individuals but, but a whole town and city. And, and that was inspiring to me. Um, but, you know, then as I got into the league, all of a sudden you, you 
kind of try to figure out, you know, your, your seat in the business world. And, um, you know, I, I was just forever attracted to founders, their vision, their mission. Um, and, and as you spoke to in the healthcare space, you see a lot of mission driven founders um, or purpose driven founders. And, um, you know, my, uh, my entry into the conversation was through investment. So um, really, you know, off the court, that's, you know, how I've approached business is, is supporting those, those founders and their efforts through investment. And tell us a little bit about free solo ventures. Yeah. Yeah. How did it come about? And maybe just want a, co a couple of examples of the type of a companies that you guys are investing in. For sure. Um, so I got connected uh, a while back with a great partner, um, Manusha Shiretti. And yeah, she, yeah, she's very impressive. Yeah, yeah. very impressive. And she's, she's the professional. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm the role player. And uh, <laughs> we look at early stage digital healthcare. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, not, not so science, set, science heavy, but rather, you know, healthcare IT, um, you know, wearables, uh, digital healthcare solutions. So, um, and as you spoke to earlier, we're um, supporting companies that uh, support value-based care. So um, that's one of our, our themes and in investment and um, it's going really well. We're, we're excited about it. And uh, if we just say someplace mission first, Profits will follow. Maybe you can expound them again. That's for yeah. 30, 31 year old you know, to be thinking that way. It's pretty. Um, I mean, it's, it's very impressive. Both yeah. both parts, the yeah. mission part, but also the need to be successful. For sure. Um, you know, one of the most w one of the guys who really got me enthused about the space was a, a gentleman, Dr. Jonathan Rothberg, who um, he's you know he's built probably 10 companies now, but um, all in the interest of uh, you know, affordable and accessible healthcare. So um, when I first met him, he was uh, developing a, a portable ultrasound that's at an unprecedented price point, $2,000. He said 70% of the world doesn't have access to medical imaging. I'm gonna be the one to afford that to them. So, um, you know, when you see people <laughs> with efforts like that and all of a sudden there are probes in, in, in Africa and in Uganda and in, in places where they've never been able to look into the body, you're like, that's inspiring. And, and you know, let me, let me do what I can to, to support and, um, and to just follow your journey because, uh, you know, that, to me, that's what I get excited about. Awesome. So, so here's one of your heroes or role models. Maybe, are there some others? Are there players, coaches, business yeah. people, politicians, philanthropists sure. that um, they're the top of mind? Yeah, um, role model. I mean, I, I always start with my parents just because, um, you know, I'm just grateful to them. Um, they always encourage me to, to, to pursue any, you know, anything. They just <laughs> almost, almost, um, almost too much, but they, they just have always given me a, a belief and a confidence to, to go in and be curious about the world and to, uh, to learn. Um, I think they're both lifelong learners and, and I hope to have picked that up from them. And then, um, you know, I, I've met so many great people in the NBA world. Um, you know, I, I've, I've had great coaches along the way. You know, obviously we talked about Coach K, but, you know, I love playing for Jason Kidd, Terry Stotts, Mike Malone, um, you know, Dwayne Casey last year. You know, it, it's always been important for me as a player to, to really like who I'm playing for and, and to believe in them. And, um, I just feel really fortunate on that front. And then I've had teammates, um, names that you would know, um, any basketball fan would know, um, that are, are role models and, and really inspiring teammates. So everybody from, from John Shire to Dame Lillard to Jokic, like just had uh, great teammates along the way. Mm -hmm. Hey, by the way, I, Perky, that's, uh, the nickname for Mason's dad and Leslie, they're probably watching, but this is just, Wonderful, wonderful family. They both were Division One basketball players. And when uh, uh, Mason's brother Miles had 18 rebounds in one game, everybody was celebrating. And Perky put his arm around Mason uh, Miles. and says, "Very good, son." But your mom had 22 rebounds as a sophomore, <laughs> as a freshman at Purdue. Yeah, she, yeah. Uh, mom <laughs> played at Purdue. So. I have a bunch of questions on your website, but I'll skip it. But I really encourage you. As part of the invitation, there's a link to um, Mason's personal website, the blog, 
both his roots, but also a bunch of interviews he's done with founders of, of businesses as well. So, you know, sake of time, I mean, I'll skip that, but really encourage you, and very, very impressive. I'm not sure if you want to say something with the, your website, but I was um, looking through it last week. I was very, very impressed with the content and thoughtfulness of it. Well, thanks. I, we had fun with the interviews. When, when the pandemic started, I, was, I had COVID at the outset and had to stay in my apartment for, for quite a while. So we just started a little interview series. Um, it's been hard to, to keep on with, with the schedule. But um, yeah, there's some fun stuff on there. And I appreciate you mm -hmm. referencing that. Now, you, you philanthropy focus. Mm -hmm. I know you went to Africa, I think, with Todd one time. Yeah. Providing coaching and to, to, to players. But um, how do you view philanthropy and what's your perspective on the three T's? To how much is given, how much is expected, and the show through time, talent, and treasure. But anyway, yeah. any comments on philanthropy? Yeah, me and Todd had a great trip. Um, you know, to me, sport in general is just such a great way you know kind of like music maybe where it, it connects across that's yeah exactly um oh, is, yeah. it connects people um you may not even speak the same language mm -hmm. but you get on the court and you have a ball and and all of a sudden you're speaking the same language but um yeah I, you know I'm, I'm passionate to to give back um and, and do it um in a in a productive way um and i've had a lot of people you know i, I haven't i haven't learned yet how to be most effective in that, but I've had people like, um, I'll, I'll give credit to Joel Anderson with that Africa trip. Mm -hmm. um, Joel's a good friend of mine. He runs a construction outfit in uh, Portland, and he's gone around the world and built schools and churches, you know, Africa, Romania. I think he's looking to do something in Mexico now, but, um, you know, to me, my approach to that is there, there are people who are spending a lot more time uh, studying, researching how to be effective in their philanthropy, and it's, it's probably better for me to partner with them in the moment than try to strike out on my own and do something, and, and uh, the learnings from working with someone like Joel has, has been incredible. Awesome, awesome. And how about the fan base? Obviously, uh, players, some players are much more accessible than others. How do you think about your fan base? Do you take time yeah. to, to meet with fans or to, yeah. to sign autographs after games? Um, autographs after games, if, you know, we have like a friends and family section, I'll, I'll definitely stop and sign it. It's funny because people are always like, oh, how do you deal with the fame or the celebrity? I played with like real celebrities, so I don't, <laughs> <laughs> like, there, there's, there's levels to it. And it's always funny when I get that question because, you know, I've been with guys who can't walk out of their hotel room without getting mobbed or, or they have to, they have to fly private because they can't walk through an airport. I, I've never felt those kind of constraints um you know so <laughs> you know it, I, I don't even feel like a celebrity to be honest you know to me the fans are what make our game so I, i'm always willing to stop take a picture sign an autograph and um you know i i keep it in perspective because i've played with kevin garnett and you go <laughs> to china and he can't walk on the sidewalk so those experiences uh put you in your place we have, you have millions of fans including i know matt thompson yeah. Thank you for giving me your shoes, Matt. It's a close family friend, a wheelchair band, but person with unbelievable enthusiasm. Shauna Schaefer Robbins, a sister, but there's many others will be watching. So I'm yeah. sure, you know, rest assured, you know, you're a role model, and you know, many people look up to you. Uh, what is your favorite free time activity? I mean, how do you relax and yeah. how do you balance Ooh. all these other business and faith activities with? Uh, yeah something that's more fun and enjoyable, if you will. Um, my, my favorite thing to do is, is travel, see the world, um, and, and really to travel with no agenda, um, to just land in a city um, and figure it out on the go. Hmm. Um, you know, it's, I think initially when I traveled, I did a lot of the touristy things, but, but instead now I, I prefer to just travel and enjoy the culture. Um, and and it's, it's been hard to do the past couple years, but. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's whenever I get the chance to, I, I love to do that. Have you been to Macedonia yet? I haven't. No, I'm, I'm waiting for you to take me. <laughs> need, need to get you there. Um, what are some of your personal objectives, say, 5, 10, or, or 35 years from now when, yeah. you, when you're my age? Uh, when you think about the future, do you have any? Yeah. Do you have um, any, um, you know, in five visions, years. if you will, of what you like to yeah. do down the road? Um, well, in five years, I hope I'm still playing. 
Um, I, I also hope to have a family. Um, you know, that, that's a, an aspiration of mine. Um, but, you know, 30, 35 years, I can promise I haven't thought about. Uh, <laughs> but, no. Time I, goes fast. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was actually reading a, a great book by Clayton Christensen, How to Measure Your Life. And um, I, I think it was from that book, one of the exercises is to, to deliver your own um, eulogy, eulogy yeah. <laughs> which is, you know, a, an interesting exercise. So, so maybe I should do that and I can answer the 35-year mm -hmm. question. Did you, have you met Clay Christensen? I, I have not. He actually spoke at Duke a couple of times. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Met him in Singapore many years ago, but he's a, God bless him, he was just an amazing, amazing yeah. human being. Yeah. Uh, I have a bunch of other follow-up questions, but uh, we'll start with the audience before this last one, but um, you, know, you and Todd have practiced together for four years, and I just want to compare notes on the accuracy of um, so all the practices that you guys have had, how many times did, as you tried to dunk on Todd, how many times did he actually stuff you? He got me a couple times. Yep, he got me a couple times. <laughs> and I'm only saying that because he's here. Good job, Todd. <laughs> See, I can go on forever, but uh, we have a microphone here. And uh, uh, also, if there's any texts, uh, but uh, Rick Young. Um, Mason, what are your thoughts on Olympic basketball, especially this past year? And I really want to know, who was the messy one with Mike's son when you lived together? <laughs> who was the Oscar? Uh, who was the Felix? Yeah. Um, so U USAB, um, you know, I'm so happy for Coach Pop and the team. Um, I thought them uh, coming home with the gold was incredible, given the circumstance, you know, playing on the other side of the world, um, all the protocols. Um, you know, I'm just, I'm just happy for that group of guys. And, and I know a couple of the guys on the team and it's gotten, it's gotten harder every Olympics. Like the, the world has gotten better at basketball. Everybody knows that if you look at the league, the makeup of the league, um, players are from all over the world. So, um, really happy. And then I think it's in a, a great transition going from, um, Colangelo to Grant Hill. I think he'll be great for the program. Um, but you know, I, I just feel very fortunate to have been a part of, of USAB for, um, you know, really since since my high school years, and, and it's a great program, and, and people like Sean Ford make it make it that. And then as far as, uh, I won't get into our into our uh, home habits, but Todd, Todd made me a better roommate, and uh, <laughs> we, we had a great time at Duke. So um, he was he was definitely the clean one, but um, we had a blast, and uh, you know I. I'm very fortunate to, to, to be friends with him and his family. Any other questions from here? Ron Ballantyne. Uh, thank you for coming, number one. Um, I'm Reverend Ron Ballantyne. I'm the uh, deacon and chaplain here. And thinking about a chaplain, in a chaplain's role. Did you have chaplains on either the Duke team or the professional teams that you've been under? Yeah. And how helpful or useful, or how did you, how did deacons, or excuse me, chaplains help you in life or your role in professional basketball? Yeah. Thank you. Great question um they're they're so important because really when you you land in a city you know i i was in denver for three years other than that i've never been in a city for more than two um and they're they're there to really um support you but also connect you with the community so you know i spoke to the 15 minutes before the game that we get together but you know i remember pastor willie alfonso in brooklyn you know he would invite me to his church should we be in town for a weekend um, he was chaplain to the to the Yankees and to the Nets for decades, and um, was just uh, was a mainstay within within the Brooklyn community. So, um, you know, they they were incredibly important. Everyone that I've worked with, they've always made themselves available, um, even post post trade or, or leaving the city. And and it's great. The NBA is such a small world. When you go back as a visiting player to connect with them and their families and. Um, you know, I can tell you it was Aleg for me in Portland. It was Kyle Spellman in Denver. Um, but you grow, you grow close to these people because you see them before every game. And, 
and they make themselves um, really available. Uh, what do you know about Charlotte? Do you, do, do, do you know many people there? I yeah, yeah. Quite a few friends, uh, Joel Hackney, Robert Stavanovsky, yeah. Rick Elias, I'd love to introduce you to. to yeah. but it's a great, great city. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, like I said, I lived in Asheville for high school, Durham for college, um, spent seven years in the state and was always I, um, I hope to, uh, to be there for a while and um, you know, it's, it's going to be a good, it's going to be a good uh, spot. Now, how well do you know Michael Jordan? As you may know, Michael is, uh, uh, is the owner of the Charlotte Hornets, uh, mm -hmm. but um, I don't know him super well. Um, I played in his uh, high school all-star game in, in high school, spoke to him then, but um, I, I don't know MJ too well. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I'll, I'll know him after this year. <laughs> yeah. Right. Mason, I have uh, two kids who just recently graduated college. Um, what do you know now that you wish you had known when you first got out of school? Oh. <laughs> um, that's, that's, that's a question. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I would just say, that, you know, really, my, my parents told me, like, going into high school, all right, now, like, every decision you make is, you know, is important for the next five years, the next 10 years. You know, they start tracking your grades in school and whatever. I think getting out of college, you, there's almost so much freedom, access, uh, anonymity that it's another transition where, you know, the, the decisions still matter. You know, people, you're, you're still connected to a community. You have a family that cares about you. You have, you know, colleagues in the workplace. Like that, that transition, I think, um, you know, I, I think is so important and, and to, uh, to benefit from, from the people that you spend time with and uh, to, to give back to that community, um, I probably would have done a better job of early in my professional career. Instead of feeling, sometimes I think, well, at least for myself, I felt like I was on an island a little bit. You know, I moved, I, I spent my first two years in New York um, and then I went out to Portland where I knew nobody, but um, yeah, I would just say, you know, benefit from the people around you and, and also see where you can um, extend yourself and, and get outside yourself. I mean, to me, I, I, I know for, I'm always better when I'm outside of myself and, and helping the next person. So um, that's something that I would probably tell myself. Do you ever compare notes with your brothers or sister on the, on the faith journey? Yeah. Um, I was actually out And um, uh, it, it's it's been great. You know, my, my little brother is in the service, and, and we talk about it. It, uh, it, you know, I think it's become increasingly important for him, um, just not knowing day to day, um, you know, what's coming. And mm -hmm. um, it also puts things in perspective for me that you know, a, a trade is not is not like a, a thing when you know when you're <laughs> going to, to protect the country. So um, yeah, no, they they've been great. Mm -hmm. A bunch of other questions, maybe from here. Yeah, go ahead. So Mason, talk about the transition from college. Certainly you go from a, we'll call it a 30 to 35 game season to an 80 game season, yeah. and it all happens very quickly. And the transition uh, from going to that, from having sort of a family atmosphere at Duke to sort of being on your own in many ways in the NBA and the travel schedule. How does your faith and, and also, you know, the people you gather around you, how does that all come together to sort of be successful and start it out in the NBA? Yeah, it becomes really important and you have to, to be proactive in, in putting those things in place. So to your point, you know, high school, college, you have a lot of people doing a lot of things for you. Once you get to the league, there's a lot of people doing a lot of things for you, but it's when you're at the facility. And then, you know, outside of that, you, you really have to, um, to think about how you spend your time. Um, really, you know, we were t talking about the business stuff. I, I wanted to find something that was challenging to me intellectually when I wasn't on the court. So I wasn't just dwelling on the game all the time, right? Um, but, you know, from, from a faith perspective, um, I didn't do a good job early on of, of uh, you know, having people that I talked to outside of the organization or, or developing friendships and relationships that, um, that are challenging on 
on the faith front, and that's something that, that I've benefited from more in the last couple years. What, were the, uh, what was the focus area of your studies when you were at Duke? Yeah. And um, uh, after the MBA, what are the things you'd like to maybe accomplish from a career standpoint? Yeah, um, so psychology was my, my major. Um, really enjoyed it. Um, and then as far as uh, post-career, you know, I'm open to, to a lot of different things. Uh, I've certainly loved investing and in, in supporting founders and in, in their their efforts. Um, you know, I, I've always felt like, um, you know, in basketball, like we sometimes we say, if if you can do, if you can't coach. You know, sometimes I feel like <laughs> if if I had you know the the great idea or or was able to execute, I'd be a founder. But if if not, then invest in the founders. So. Um, you know, I, I don't know what, what post-career will bring, but I'm certainly open to, to, to anything. Hey, Mason, since uh, Mrs. Zeff and I started dating many decades ago, things have changed. So do you use dating apps? I, and is there a place for you to invest if yeah. you're not happy with them right now? Or yeah. So I, try, try to help along with your family ambition. For sure, for sure. No, I, I, I recently, I, I have a girlfriend. Um, we've been seeing each other. We've known each other for a long time, but well, you've, recently. You've not introduced us to her yet. You know who she is, but we'll talk about that. <laughs> um, yeah, but no, I, I tried dating apps. You know, it's hard, like during, during uh, the pandemic, you know, it, it's not easy to connect with people and also just be, again, like the schedule, like you're, you know, you live somewhere in the off season, in season, you're traveling all the time. It's, it's been, a, it's been a challenge for me, for sure, um, and, and I haven't always gone about it the right way, but um, yeah, I have tried dating apps, and, and I'm really excited about who I'm seeing now and, and hopeful. Well, can't after. wait to see her, if, yeah. if I know her already, all right? <laughs> How many <laughs> rebounds? What's that? How many rebounds has she had? <laughs> How many rebounds? <laughs> I'm just curious how you live out your faith uh, when you play and also with your investments as well. Yeah. That's a, such a great question. Uh, yeah. He's part of the, <clears throat> a fellow for, for Christians athlete. Okay. Yeah. Fellowship of Christian athletes. Yep. Um, to me, a, l a lot of the, um, a lot, a lot of the principles that, that come through in the Bible are, are so applicable to being on the court. Um, you know, in, in moments of weakness, especially whether mentally or physically, um, th there's always something to reference. And uh, I, I've definitely benefited from that. Um, just even in words from the Bible, like in belief, like steadfast, immovable, unwavering, those kind of things, they, they, come, they come into your mental when you're in the game. Um, you know, I'll, I'll run and not grow weary. I'll walk and not faint when you're in game 95 in the playoffs and it's you, know, like you start you start connecting things like that but um no it, it's become really important to me and then you know for on the investing side like proverbs has been you know invaluable um you know i think uh th there's not there's not a decision that i make where i don't reference something you know from from solomon so it's um you know it you know one thing if, if you're in uh, sports as well. Uh, Mo Machowski again shared with me that um, Dr. Naismith, when he invented basketball, was saying, you know, I, I want a game where where the athletes can meet their maker, right? And so I really like that, knowing that um, the game was, um, you know, kind of built around faith in, in a sense. And um, there are certainly times you know, whether it's, it's working through something with a teammate or a coach or, or the competition itself or uh, every season has highs and lows and, and dealing with those from a faith perspective has been really um, helpful to me. The seasons, I think the regular season and off season are very different. Yeah. Um, what are the, how do you find time for business and investing during the season and get, how different is that uh, in the off season? Yeah, I, my off seasons have, have evolved. Um, yeah, I, I didn't take a whole lot of time off um, my first couple years in the league. I was younger in the league. I, I wanted to be um, in market with my team. Um, of course, the USAB stuff, that, that's a whole season within itself, mm -hmm. and I've done that uh, twice now. But um, the later I get in my career, 
um, the more disciplined I am about how much time I'm taking off. Because I think that the natural inclination is to, well, I want to stay in the gym. I want to work on this. I want to, I want to hoop because because that's all you've known. But um, you know, I, I've intentionally uh, started getting my body re ready later in the summer, and then uh, it affords a lot of downtime. And um, it is very different. But again, just finding ways to to stay productive um, with that downtime. Uh, if there's no other questions, I think it's um, almost 8.30, we promise you, and we'll finish at 8.30, Mason is, um, we'll be flying to Miami, I think, um, uh, over the weekend. Uh, yeah. The season, the NBA season starts on, actually, the, the preseason, the practice starts next week? Yeah, so we have volunteer, yeah, we're, we're doing a team event down in Miami, and then, um, you know, training camps at the end of the month, so everybody will be in Charlotte ready to go. So thank you again, Mason. This is just uh, amazing reflections. It's so nice to see you again, yeah. the Church of the Holy Spirit. So thank you very much. Thank you. And as always, we're going to finish up with a prayer. So right, thanks, great, for you guys. And uh, just to quote Mason, we've had a ball. <laughs> said earlier today. We've had a ball. I invite everyone in person to stand. Yeah. And before we go into our concluding prayer, i just uh, take a moment to thank Mike Zaff, Mike Zafiroski and Bob, Bob Murley, Murley, if you're watching, and everyone who's been involved with Faith at Work, uh, our 100th Faith at Work, never better, never <laughs> better. Thank you, Mike, thank and you. thank you, Mason. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, please join me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.